As we return to Matthew's gospel, Jesus has entered Jerusalem for the Passover celebration in what will turn out to be the last week of his earthly life. The parable of the ten bridesmaids is featured only in Matthew, the first of three stories in chapter 25 that allude to the coming of the Son of Man and the final judgment. No one knows the day or the hour of Christ's expected return. As in the previous chapter, listeners are advised to stay awake and to live prepared. Today's scripture is Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13, on page 26 in the New Testament. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, here is a bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Holy words for God's people. Let's continue in prayer. <laughs> you might come to our side and help us to keep our lamps trimmed and burning. Whatever it is that I may say in these minutes, may it be your word that we hear. For when you speak, we know who we are and what we are to do. Amen. Ba-dum, ta-dum, ba-dum, ta-dum. Are you ready? Like last Sunday, we gather today around a wedding story. It's the story of a bridegroom and a bride and their wedding party and their communities in ancient Palestine. It's the story of Matthew's original community struggling to wait faithfully for the decisive return of their risen Lord. It's the story of God's ongoing invitation to humanity to live in covenant relationship with God. Will you marry me? It's the story, like at any wedding, of a new family forming and all the loss and opportunity implicit in that occasion. It's the story of one kind of world for this family ending and another kind of world beginning. It's a story with eschatological overtones. We continue this morning in our Lenten sermon series, Twists in Scripture. Did you bump into any twists in the parable you heard just now? I am wrestling with two significant twists, two glaring challenges to my expectations of the life of discipleship and of my expectations of the kingdom of God. One twist is that the wise bridesmaids in this story They don't share their oil. The other twist for me is that the doors to the wedding banquet are shut, and the Lord apparently resolves to keep them that way. Not sharing oil? That doesn't sound like discipleship to me. Not opening the party doors? That doesn't sound like Christ's lordship to me? What's going on here? Really, God? Well, in the patrilocal family structure 
of Jesus' time and place. A groom would set up new quarters in his father's house or on his father's compound, if you will. And there in this, in this new place that the groom would prepare, that's where he and his partner would reside after they got married. And when everything was ready and when whatever marital arrangements had been agreed upon, the groom would then go to the bride's household and pick her up, and then they would process back to the father's house for the consummation of their marriage and the festivities that would go on from there. The role of the bridesmaids would be to accompany the procession from one place to the other and to welcome the couple and the whole arriving party to that new household and that new life on the father's compound. Henceforth, the bride would identify wholly with the groom's family. And that is part of the cultural setting for today's wedding story. In the picture that our scripture paints today, perhaps the groom is heading to the bride's family place to pick her up. And the bridesmaids, other translations say the virgins, there to go with her and meet the groom and accompany her back. I think when we think of the bridesmaids, they're the virgins, there's those who are of marriageable age. We could think of them as groomsmen as well. There are, after all, male and female virgins still, aren't there? So think of them as groomsmen, if that helps you enter the story. Their task is to companion the procession, to light the way, to facilitate the celebration, to welcome the groom and the bride home for the wedding and the feast. Most Bible scholars understand this story to be an allegory, a symbolic story, if you will in which the marriage feast, the wedding banquet, is the gathering of the Messiah and his people, the consummation of their relationship. The bridegroom would be Jesus, the risen Christ. The bridesmaids, perhaps, represent the church. Or if, as in the wedding in Revelation, if the bride is the church, maybe the bridesmaids are those who are coming of age, who are preparing themselves, who are about ready to cross over into married life themselves. The bridegroom's delay in the symbolic story and later arrival may be symbolic of the future coming of Christ, the second coming, perhaps, and the oil Perhaps that is the stuff that really matters as Christ arrives, the spiritual grounding that fills us, the faithful deeds of love and mercy that we participate in, the spiritual oil of good works, of faithfulness, perhaps. I really like the torches in this story because it's Israel's mission as spelled out all over Isaiah, it's Israel's mission to be light to the nations. And so here, if we imagine the bridesmaids as the people of the church out bearing their light, earlier in Matthew's gospel, he has said to, Jesus has said to his followers, you are the light of the world. And we can fold all that into this image of the bridesmaids or the groomsmen with their torches out to light the way, to welcome and lead the procession, to welcome the party home. In today's story, they're going to need midnight oil. They need to have oil for midnight because darkness does fall. Darkness has fallen on Judaism in Jesus' time. In 70 AD, Rome destroys the temple for a second time. This is a decade or so before Matthew's gospel is written. Darkness has fallen on the early Matthean community, the original audience for Matthew's gospel. They've been kicked out of the synagogue. They're suffering persecution under Emperor Nero, perhaps, at this time. They know darkness. Midnight is not a good time to realize you're out of oil. Midnight is precisely when the oil is most needed. Now, 50% of the bridesmaids or the groomsmen, if you will, in our story today, they're ready with extra oil, but 50%, half of us, are not ready for midnight. 
Maybe they thought in the story, no problem, we can always ask our friends. That usually works. It usually works, right? But in this case, surprise, it doesn't fly. Sorry, the prepared bridesmaids say, but if we give you our oil, we won't have any, and, and that really won't serve. They don't share the oil. Does that bother anybody else? They don't share the oil, but as I wrestle with this, I realize there are some things, perhaps, which can't be shared. I watch my teenage kids work in groups to do their homework, and I'm sure the temptation is sometimes there just to say, here, copy what I did. But then in giving away my homework, I can't give away what I learned doing my homework, can I? If you participate in Bothell Community Kitchen, you have stepped into the grace that flows there. You have met some of the people. You have been graced by your preparations and your presence to all that. Jeannie Lohman and Claudia and, and Craig Haskins and Trika, they invite us to participate in that, but they can't give us what's formed them in their participation. In order to experience that kind of grace, we have to engage in it ourselves, don't we? I want you to know I purchased a yoga mat a while back. And I recently downloaded four pages of beginner core exercises to do upon that yoga mat. But the purchase and the download are not yet shaping my core because I haven't engaged those practices. You know that moment in a wedding, a modern-day wedding, oftentimes the community is invited to pledge their support for those that are uniting. It's an important moment in the wedding ceremony. But we can't pledge that support. We can't pledge that presence for anybody else. We have to offer it, and it's a valuable thing, right? The truth is, Reverend Cheryl Peterson says, no one can give someone else the spiritual oil that they need. Oil apparently is readily available. It sounds like they all know the 7-Eleven will have some. It doesn't sound like money is an issue. They're able to go and procure some oil from this 7-Eleven in ancient Palestine. Maybe faith isn't all that hard to come by, and maybe faith, too, is a renewable resource, but maybe it has to be personally engaged, personally practiced in order to develop. You may know the common, the, the common story, the popular story. You may know the story of the rabbi and the soap maker. Have you heard that one? Where there's a soap maker who has traditionally been part of a rabbi's congregation in Europe somewhere, and the rabbi notices that he hasn't shown up in some time, maybe even years. And he pays the soap maker a visit, and they take a walk around the city, and the soap maker tries to explain, Rabbi, look at this city. Life is hard. Religion has been around for years, and it's just not working. We still have war. We still have broken relationships. We still have poverty. We still have disease. We still have suffering. Religion doesn't work, Rabbi. I'm sorry. What's the point? The rabbi listens. They continue walking. They round the corner, and there's a handful of children playing. Slovenly children soiled children playing in the street. The rabbi observes, huh, those children are soiled, they're dirty. I guess soap doesn't work. The soap maker is startled. Of course soap works, he says, but if you want soap to work, you have to use it. Exactly agrees the rabbi, exactly. The later arriving bridesmaids arrive, I'm afraid, to a shut door. They have extra oil in hand now, and they call out, Lord, Lord, open unto us. Oh, my word. They're told Truly, I tell you, I do not know you. And by extension, I'm afraid, you do not know me. Ouch. 
I hope that maybe this was some other Lord they were talking to. Maybe this wasn't the groom, but no, these are the very words that appear in the Sermon on the Mount as it rounds its end. Jesus says, not everybody who calls me Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father. Mm. I wonder what happens on that procession that these bridesmaids missed. I wonder if that procession is symbolic of the getting to know each other time, if that procession is symbolic of the practicing time when we learn to love God and love neighbor and love self, when we try it on and we experience the grace of that. I may be wrong, but I think that Jesus returns each time we reach for him. I think Jesus returns each time we partake of the bread and cup of communion, each time we practice loving God and neighbor and self, each time we dare to forgive and dare to love our enemies, each time we pray and do for others what we want done for ourselves. I think Jesus returns each time we participate in such things. And yet maybe that's not the fullness of his anticipated return in glory. But then maybe the delay in our story today is good news. Maybe delay is a blessing for us, a blessing for me to have another day, to engage what God invites me to engage. In the Mediterranean society of Jesus' time, on time apparently meant whenever the significant person arrived. So that really, there would be no late. When the people are there, that's on time. As if, though we so often can't see it in the moment, as if God's timing is all right after all. I'm only just now learning what it means to wait upon the Lord. Sooner or later, though, <laughs> It seems the day does come. Christ returns in some kind of blazing glory or we die or both. I don't know exactly. But sooner or later, the moment comes and at that point, it may be that better late than never no longer applies. This parable, like the preceding one in chapter 24, instructs us to stay awake to keep watch, to pay attention. And I want to say, stay awake, keep watch, let's pay attention, let's watch out for opportunity, let's watch out for invitation to engage in this life God calls us to, to join the procession, to load up on spiritual oil as we practice love. I'm not talking about works righteousness. I know we need to be careful about that sort of thing as, as, as if we earn our salvation, but I'm talking about the nature of participation. Participating in love, we participate in God. Participating in God, we enter into God's kingdom. We secure spiritual oil, not just for our own personal torches, but for our kingdom tasks. And I think it's not something someone else can do for us. And I think it's not something we can really do for someone else. Marriage is a central metaphor for our relationship with God, for God's relationship with God's people. What might it look like to join in the procession, lighting the way, welcoming our bridegroom and the bride home, celebrating a sort of culmination and inauguration all at once. What might it look like to apply our faith and to show up for life with plenty of fuel? John's gospel doesn't tell this story this way, but hear these words with wedding ears on from John's gospel. Jesus says to those who follow him, to those who engage the way he blazes even through the cross, 
He says, in my Father's house are many rooms. I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again to take you to myself so that where I am, you may also be. It's wedding talk. Are you ready? Ready? 